When I was younger, my dream job that I told my parents and they, and they laughed at me was wanting to be like a YouTuber and making content for people online. My name is Maya. I'm 18 now, but I've been playing music and sharing it online since I was in middle school. And then other people started listening to it. Last week, 14,000 people listened to Maya's songs. What? And then I got some media attention. How would you react if you were on a Snapchat story and then you had to like come to school? <laughs> I didn't tell anyone, not even my mom and dad. Neither of us saw this coming. No. But then it got to a point where I couldn't hide it anymore. This girl came up to me, she goes, excuse me, are you Maya? And she was like, oh my God, I love your music. There were some scary moments. Nobody signs up for having 13-year-old girls send you death threats. And some really unexpected ones. Every single kid in the room was singing every single word. Should we just get into it? Let's do it. And now, after all of that, I'm taking on the biggest moment so far. Recording my first full-length album in New York City with a producer who I have never met before. You only have one first album. You can't really go back and redo it. I just want to write a goddamn good song. Why is it so hard to do that? Today. And I have a feeling it's not going to be easy. I'm MXM Tune, and this is 21 Days. So, like I said, my name is Maya, but I make music under the name MXM Tune. I'm 18 years old and I'm from Oakland, California. But right now, I'm in New York City and I'm on my way to a recording studio to start making my album. Where are we going? I don't know where we're going. <laughs> that's my producer. His name is Robin. I haven't been in this neighborhood. Oh, that's so cute. Right? At this time last year, I was getting ready to graduate from high school, and I had only ever recorded my songs in my bedroom. So this is a huge step up for me and for my music. Oh yeah. I've also never really been away from my family for longer than a few days, and I'll be living here in New York on my own for three weeks while I finish the album. Oh, and on top of everything else, I've also never made a podcast before. <laughs> Hang a right. Make a right. <laughs> oh my God. Is it really dark in there? Thank you. Thank you. Whoa. Oh, it is dark, really. It's so nice and cool in here. Hi. Hello. Nice Hello. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hi, Robin. Hey, how are you? I'm, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, they have a piano. That's so good. So cool. Oh my God, an actual piano? And drum kit? I love oh, yeah. I made it into the studio with Robin. I can't believe everything here is mine to use for the next three weeks. Oh, is that an organ? I think so. That's so cool. After getting settled into the space, we pretty much get straight to work. That's all I know. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know how to play drums. That's going to be interesting. Are we getting a drum line? Yes. Oh, super cool. Robin is awesome. I'm really thankful he's here producing the album. So yeah, I'm I'm 20. I'm from the UK. I currently, I currently live in London. I'm Maya's producer for this album. Um, and I have a music project called Cave Town, which is something I've been working on since I was about 13 years old. Oh, hell yeah. Make me happy. Late nights are lonely. Lonely. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's so soft. Lonely. 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 <laughs> Like Robin mentioned, he makes his own music too. That's how I first found out about him. Well, actually, my dad found him first. This was back when MXM Tune was first taking off, and my dad started paying more attention to other young artists. I get in the car, and my dad says, have you heard of this artist, Cave Town? And I was like, 
no, I haven't. What, what's, you know, what's the deal with Cave Town? And my dad said, I just found him on YouTube one day and he has a song, Lemon Boy. Oh, it's so good. And we listened to it and it was like the only song we listened to in the car that day because it was so good. And I just became a fan from there on out. I remember I just saw, we were both like each other's top recommended artists when you go onto our Spotify's. So I always knew who she was. First song I heard, I guess, was Falling For You, because when you go onto her Spotify, it's just right there, big big numbers, right at the top of the list. So I was like, cool, I'll listen to that, and I thought, that, oh, that's really sweet. The first time Robin and I worked together, it was just one song. And because we live so far apart, it was all done over email. Here in New York, it's the first time we're actually meeting face to face. Usually when I meet someone from online, it feels strange seeing them for the first time in person, but it felt like I'd seen her before, which was very strange. It's so interesting whenever you meet someone that you've known online for the first time in person, because it's you feel like you know so much about them, and then at the same time, absolutely nothing at all. I think this collaboration is going to be great, actually. And I'm really glad he's here. Having someone to bounce ideas off of is incredible. I feel like he hears things the way I wish I heard things sometimes in terms of like imagining all the different layers and elements that you can add onto things. That's one of those songs I'm not exactly sure where to go with production on that. I think it sounds like just keeping it simple. Because it's supposed to be like a quieter song. Yeah, they play around some synth noises. Things seem like they're off to a good start. It's like suspenseful. Maybe later in the song? Okay. It wasn't even that long ago I was just recording songs by myself in my bedroom. And I mean, I still do that, but it's all hitting me. I'm really doing this. I know that producing 10 songs in 21 days is going to be a challenge. I hope we can do it. Before I get too ahead of myself, I should probably tell you about how I got here. Like I said before, my 13-year-old dream was to be a professional YouTuber. I was six years old when the internet came and it took a hold on me. YouTube was the first. It started when I was 11. Everyone at my age then was starting their own social media accounts and trying to come up with nice usernames, and so I decided I had to make my own. I made an Instagram account under the name MXMTune, which MXMT are my initials. Tune was because my dad said, why don't you make it like cartoon? You know, you post your drawings or whatever. And I gain validation from the likes on my vines. Oh yeah, my life is online. 13 reposts, what the hell, that's not fine. The reason that I even started going on social media was because I wanted to have a place where I could kind of post whatever I wanted in a judgment-free zone for an audience that maybe didn't know me the same way that the people in my real world life did. I took violin and cello lessons when I was little. Then in middle school, I learned how to play the ukulele and sang in the school rock band. If you're not sure what a ukulele sounds like, there it is. I had started making YouTube videos, mostly about family trips and stuff like that, and I think the most popular video I had had like a thousand views. But then I started recording songs and posting them on SoundCloud. I recorded late at night in my bedroom after my entire family was asleep. 
I guess people enjoyed my posts because I would get a handful of likes every single day. Then they would go over to my YouTube channel and subscribe to me, and even leave comments. My few dozen followers turned into a couple hundred, which was pretty weird, but also super exciting. Hi everyone! I said that I would film this video a while back because I asked you guys what you wanted to see and this is one of the options, so you guys chose this option and now here we are making this video. Hopefully it won't be boring. If you are a musician, maybe it'll be interesting. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't promise you anything. We'll see how it goes. I thought it was pretty cool that people liked my stuff, and I tried to respond to every single comment. Honestly, like, if you've ever considered taking lessons or just teaching yourself how to play something, you should totally do it. And you could learn how to sing, too. Anybody can sing. Honestly, I don't even know if I'm good still. I'm eating curry in that video. I like to keep things casual. All right, that's it for this video. Um, if you guys want to hear me sing, well, then you just freaking follow me on SoundCloud. But, uh, yeah. Anyways. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and you can subscribe if you want to. I mean, like, pretty bad at uploading, so, you know, just do what you want. Anyways, bye! I mean, I was a 16-year-old kid making music quietly so I wouldn't wake up my parents, and then all of a sudden people listened to it. The first original song I posted was called 1-800-DATE-ME, and... Yeah, I cringe every single time I listen to that song now. It's not actually Valentine's Day where I live, but it is somewhere in the world, and I figure, you know, I gotta write a song about this. So, if you can relate, give it a like. At that point, I'd only been posting covers and stuff on my SoundCloud, maybe because it was an original and people were like, oh, we didn't expect you to post this. Let's give it a listen because it's not a cover of a song that we might have heard a million times already. But it never works out, so I'm done. It's Valentine's Day. And I'm lonely and single, but it's better this way. The song caught people's attention because, well, it's called 1-800-DATE-ME. And... People are definitely going to click on something that's called that. Oh, guy after guy, crush after crush, I never really figured it out with someone. Even though I cry, I'm not in a rush. I prefer Netflix over every. Apparently, lots of people found this song relatable. My few hundred followers grew to over a thousand. This is so good. It deserves a follow. I love you. How are you supposed to feel about that? Because it's a really interesting thing to happen to you. But I was also excited. Like it felt, it felt like a validating experience too. To write a song and have people enjoy it. But I do like Pringles. Please date me. I was going to school during the day and hanging out with my family at home, but I didn't share my online world with any of them. And the weird thing is, I love my family so much. I'm really close with my parents, but for some reason, I really wanted to keep this one thing just for myself. Having a place where I could go and do everything on my own terms was super liberating. Kind of like a secret treehouse, just like the modern version. Meanwhile, my numbers were growing into the thousands. I was getting to know some of the commenters and interacting with them, and it really started to feel like a community. I even made YouTube videos showing people how to play some of my songs. Hi everyone, so today I'm gonna to be going over the chords for Porcelain, which are pretty simple. I think you can handle them. Should be good, should be a good time. Let's get started. If you're wondering why- story Having the separation of someone listening to it on a screen in another country is is so much more comfortable for me than having Yay. someone sit right next to me and, you know, look at the wall as they listen intently to what I'm saying, which is oftentimes really personal. Over a baritone ukulele. So first thing you're gonna do, grab your ukulele and put a capo on the second fret. Um, yes. The songs that I was writing at that point were a little bit more emotionally vulnerable. I was always terrified of sharing those with my family and with my friends and my immediate community because I didn't want them to feel like it was about them, like it was like their fault for me being sad. My name is Birdie, but I barely know how to fly. I'm 
lost in a place I don't know how to describe I was pretty bummed out but it wasn't anything that had to do with them it was just me being a teenager there's nothing in the middle for me I keep trying to side with one but it's just so hard to try and be and no one My brother Dylan and I are super tight, and I really wanted to share this with someone at home. When my sister approached me, she says, like, I don't, like, don't tell mom or dad, but, you know, I'm, I'm kind of getting big on this social media platform. I'm just like, oh, okay. Well, what's that mean? <laughs> Does that mean, like, 10 people liked your stuff? <laughs> you didn't really get it. By this time, my music was kind of blowing up, and I was still not telling my parents. My mom was always one of those people that was like, would do Google searches of our names and make sure that our imprint on the world was very minimal and like didn't have any presence online and she would praise us for like oh my gosh good job you have private accounts on Instagram or whatever and I had this other side of myself that was a a public figure to a certain extent where I was like you know a personality online that people were interacting with and they had no idea until one one day I I woke up I checked my Twitter that my parents didn't know about and I saw that I was mentioned in a Hypebeast article, and I was like, oh, shit, like, I really have to tell my mom and dad now, and I was like, oh, crap. The article was called 15 New Bedroom Pop Artists You Should Check Out, and I was somehow one of the 15. For a brief minute, I thought about running away, but I decided against it. So I garnered up my courage, and I walked into the kitchen. I said, Mom, Dad, I have to tell you something. That's my mom. She's talking about the very moment I'd been dreading. And I was like, oh my God, Maya, you, wait, what's happening? It was shocking. It was like she just came out of the closet for music. <laughs> She's laughing about it now, but at the time, we were all pretty uncomfortable. My parents are both teachers, and they pride themselves on knowing exactly what's going on with their kids. Plus, I had never really hidden anything from them before, if you can believe that. So... It was a real shock to discover I had this whole other part of my life that they knew nothing about. I knew she was doing covers. Like, she was really into singing covers, and at that point I also knew she was doing SoundCloud in a little bit, but I really didn't know how much music she was doing on her own at that point. We now see those videos, and we're like, oh my god, what, you were (laughs) singing all that song? Yeah, she was doing it all in secret. Um, We had no—I mean— For an educator who's also about, like, you need to know what's up with your children. You all need to pay attention. Like, stay on text. Know what your child's internet footprint is going to look like. You have to be involved. I was, like, eating my words because I had no idea my daughter was, like, doing all these things. It felt like a huge relief to finally share this big secret that I had been hiding from them. I thought they might be mad or hurt, but actually, they totally understood We understood that for her, it was almost like her diary. It was her personal space. It was so private, even though it was public. Um, But it was private from us, so it it felt like her own thing. And so I think all of a sudden it was like reconciling that with her. Like, okay, now we need to know what your business is a little bit. And we need to know what this means because you're putting yourself out there. So it was like having all those conversations that we have done really well with other parents of other children and having it for ourselves with her. I mean, she told me in what, fifth grade or something, mom, one day I'm gonna be a YouTube star. And I'm like, you go for it, honey, that's great for you. And I just completely didn't think that that would be what she'd end up doing. For better or for worse, I lost my secret treehouse. I couldn't hide MXM tune from my family anymore. And I didn't know it then, But things were about to get even crazier for me. More on that after the break. After my family found out about my music, I was still writing songs late at night. But I didn't have to keep it a secret anymore. My parents even let me turn our guest room into a recording studio. Naturally, I made a video about it. Hi everyone. If you're wondering where I am, this is my new setup. I will do a tour of this 
at some other point. My desk and everything is set up and I have all of my equipment um, here. You can see my new mics back there. Um, and yeah, I've got my computer and stuff in front of me. Um, but yeah, if it's a little bit bare, I apologize. Um, it serves its function and I'm pretty happy about it. At that time, I was getting something like a thousand comments on my stuff. Every day. Love your music. Love your voice. Love the cello. Need to collab. We have a very similar style. This is so good. Such a beautiful song. Bro, this song gets me in my feels. It's the song. This is so good. Hey, everybody. If you're wondering um, if anything else is going on in terms of music, I can't really believe what's been happening. I don't know. I'm just some teenager who makes music in her room, in her pajamas. I mean, I'm in my pajamas. I knew this was a moment of opportunity and that it might never come again. So I decided to focus on music professionally, which, as it turns out, is a whole different ballgame. Oh, Christian says career goals other than SoundCloud uke mom. Um, to be honest, I have literally zero clue. I just want to be able to do like everything that I like doing, which is designing, I like making music, I like doing art, I like interacting with you guys. I hopefully can keep doing that. Who knows? Then. I started getting messages from labels and publishers and promoters about shows which felt like just really overwhelming. I was still juggling classes and wanting to graduate without my GPA falling too much and understanding what my next year was going to look like. I had a business email set up. There were people from the industry reaching out asking me what I was interested in doing. So it would be like going out during lunch and then having to take a phone call and you know, talking to these people who have been working in this gigantic unknown entity that I had no understanding of. It just felt like I was juggling so much. You know, I was a 17-year-old kid who really just wanted to finish off senior year, and also this musician who's trying to figure out how to make something a little bit bigger than what I had currently had existing on SoundCloud and Spotify and YouTube or whatnot. I was really scared to have those sorts of conversations about my future and my career. I was terrified of getting taken advantage of by people that work in the industry because there's all the horror stories. I didn't want to ruin this sort of tiny world that I had built for myself with music. And I wanted to hold on to the feeling that I had at that point for as long as possible. When I told my parents, they were also terrified because I'm their daughter and they don't want anything bad to happen to me or for me to run myself into trouble. Had you copyrighted your songs? Have you filed for copy? Have you, have you signed up for, um, what's the, the ASCAP? No. ASCAP. ASCAP. Yeah, Ooh, that, did you, something. did you, yeah, you got it. Exactly. Well, that's my dad. He likes to fix things. And most of the time, he's really good at it. You know, the whole legal thing scared the hell out of me. Seriously profound responsibility. That you There's only so much that you can learn from a book like Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business. I'm like reading this book and I'm like chapter after chapter. And, and I'm, you're like, you, know, you should be this and you should be this. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I've told her to read this book a million times. There was a point where I had to say, Dad, you need to back off. You're not my manager. You're my dad. And I just want you to be my dad. We just needed someone that knew what they were doing. I got an email from this music management company. They wanted to talk to me about my plan as an artist and wanting to meet with me and, you know, have a chat. They flew to San Francisco. We had tea because I was too nervous to eat. And then, yeah, two weeks later, I decided I want to work with them. So it was good. It was like fast. And then ever since then, I've been hanging out with them. They're very funny, very tall. Um, and then, then that's my two descriptors for them, funny and tall. Their names are Max and Kirk, and they came out to Oakland to meet my whole family. The thing that initially caught my ear about what Maya was doing was her songwriting um, and how raw it was. It almost feels like both of them are like two different versions of myself in a way. Like Max is, you would look at him and be like, yeah, he's a type A individual. Kirk is very chill, uh, kind of funny. We have the ongoing relationship of just making fun of each other, which sounds horrible, but out of love. Max and Kirk are my managers now, but it did take me a little while to get used to saying that. 
I have managers. She's just a uniquely badass songwriter, given her age. She had played one show, and we saw a video that her dad took on his phone. Every single kid in the room had their phone out and was singing every single word. So, like, these songs are the anthems uh, for the next generation, seemingly, or at least a pocket of this generation, and um, that was really exciting. We feel very protective of Maya because she's awesome and a young woman um, and super sweet, and we want to see her win. They basically help me navigate the industry and figure out what opportunities to pursue, whether it's recording, playing live shows, selling merchandise, or other stuff I hadn't even thought about. I decided to stay independent as long as possible. It just gives me the opportunity to be as creative as I'd like to be without constraints or restrictions on what sort of projects I want to do. This is her party. She was very nice to have us arrange and bartend the party. Um, She doesn't drink, terrible example. She's also really underage, but um, it's her party. And we are going to protect her as any good manager would. That's, you know, that's part of the gig. If you run the fastest, you don't necessarily win the race in this business. There's a tremendous amount of luck and the public is determining your success at the end of the day. Um, If you're a woman, if you're young, if you're a person of color, like it's just hard. And it's hard to make it if you're a straight white dude too. Like it, it is just a hard business. But the point being like, you know, Maya, she had forces against her. When I was making music on my own, I just recorded my songs in my bedroom and posted them online whenever I felt like it. Now, I had a team and we were making plans together. I was still figuring out what success could look like, but whatever that might be, I wanted it for all of us. I had wanted to make a full-length album for a long time. From a, you know, artistic and creative and professional standpoint, working on an album just felt like a really good challenge, and I think that as a person, I want to continually strive to put myself in uncomfortable situations or in challenging situations because I can grow a lot from those. We decided I should record in a real studio this time with a producer and other musicians in New York City. I mean, in your bedroom is like a no pressure environment. Whereas if you're in a more formal setting, you might feel pressure to write about a certain thing or sound a certain way, or there could be people who are influencing your decisions on what to write about or what sound to make. I obviously have concerns considering this is the first time she's ever made a record that it's not going to get done in the limited time that we have, or um, we don't feel like we have the songs that we need, whatever. I mean, I've never had a client make a record where everything has gone perfectly. When we started working together, she was um, scared of the idea of traveling, scared of the idea of stepping outside her comfort zone, scared of leaving Oakland, scared of getting on a plane. I was the kid that got picked up early because I missed my mom. Um, So thinking about the possibility of being in New York for three weeks of my life, living with someone that I'd never met in person before, and working in a studio that I had never been in, I just think that this sort of task would have seemed so impossible because I had never challenged myself to do something like this before. Conquering your fears is probably the ultimate challenge, right? She's a young female artist in a business that has been littered with young female artists who get taken advantage of in any number of ways. To be able to protect her and make sure that she's being cared for, like that's just on a human level important. So we're just trying not to fuck this up. Me too, Max. Me too. And now, here's the song Late Nights from the album. Late nights are for lonely people Lying awake, hardly laying peaceful 
My mind is restless with the thoughts of you And all the things you do I can hardly close my eyes under the glow I'm MXM Tune, and this is 21 Days. 21 Days is a Spotify original podcast. Jesse Burton and Yasi Salek are the executive producers for Spotify, and Francisco Quijada is the program manager. Theme music and original score composed by Eugene Cho. 21 Days is produced in collaboration with the team at Signal Company No. 1. Executive producer, Kevin Wardis. Senior producer, Ann Pope. Story editor, Ashley Cleek. Producers, Martin Gonzalez, Zach St. Louis, and Jesse Wright Mendoza. 21 Days is narrated by me, Maya. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at MXMTune. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>